Hi, hello. I'm trying very hard not to slip on the various gaps with my ridiculous shoes, so this is always a very good start. Um, so, for a really long time, I've been completely obsessed with ghost stories because they are these fascinating cultural items which reveal the most kind of, as Tobias said, anxieties and weird, interesting ways of thinking. Where the voices in the static are coming from, where the pipes are creaking, can often tell us about those weird things. There's a fantastic story, well, actually it's a film, um, called The Babadook, which I really hope most of you have seen, or if you should, you should go and see it, where the ghost manifests itself as grief, because when a woman's partner dies, this ghost becomes a thing that she works out her own grief and her motherhood from. They really reveal things about ourselves that we didn't even knew was possible. And I'm really in intrigued by using this as a way to explore technology, and in particular, uh, data and algorithms. Now, one of the stories that I like about this is uh, a, a story that Houdini uh, told. Well, it's actually it's a real case um, in Victorian spiritualism, where he put up a, a great big grand prize of 5,000 pounds, which is about 250,000 euros now, to prove the existence of spirits. And there was one person who came forward who was his greatest opponent, and she was called Marjorie uh, Mina Crandon, the Boston medium. And through a series of really elaborate uh, bells and whistles and levers, she tried to convince him that her dead brother was speaking through her. And Houdini, being Houdini, who's a genius, just said, no, I'm not having any of that. That's ridiculous, because ghosts don't exist. But I really like the fact that you're trying so hard with this technology. Because he used technology to make great big illusions about things. Now, fast forward 100 years to the 1950s, where the way that we suddenly marked our, our technology was as science fiction or as the future. And then 30 years later, it became magic, as Tobias says. We have some similarities. We do work together quite closely. Um, in the case of this Honeywell ad, and as I mentioned before, data and algorithms are often seen as a kind of magic in that way. So in this case with Honeywell, this data stream, something a very well-recognized data stream that we know, our emails, suddenly becomes complete and utter magic. This guy is clearly really bugged out by this. Because you don't need to know how they worked or what happened. They just do. They come to you. It's magic. That's all you need to worry about. Now, this becomes worrying when you have things like Apple's adverts, which says that you are more powerful than you think. Our technology turns you into a magician. You are able to do whatever you want with this tiny computer in your hand. However, it's actually a really powerful obfuscation technique, and it makes you think that you're doing the magic when, in fact, you're just a component in their system that you don't have any ownership over. You can be part of their system on their terms. They are the magicians. They cast a spell. They tell you how you can get involved. Now, Bruno Latour, who is a science philosopher, probably one of the, the, the best-known ones, very, very interesting French chap, um, came up with the idea of the black box, where you can see what goes in and what comes out, but not actually how the decisions are made and what happens. So these opaque processes that we can't see remove our agency and don't allow us to actually have any ability to see what goes on. And this can become really problematic when we tell these stories and use these stories to explore anxieties around algorithms and data. Now, in the case of Rita Parsons, who was a, a young girl in 2013 who unfortunately killed herself after a, a, a quite relentless campaign of cyberbullying from some of her, her classmates, um, and her picture was used massively widely on social media. It was everywhere because it was quite a highly publicized death. Now, her, her family and friends, as you can see, were rightly really shocked about this because when you, you don't think that your, that your child's ending up going to be an advert because the third-party algorithms that are used by Facebook's advertisers found this image and turned it into an advert for singles in her area because it just read it as, through the metadata, a woman, 18 to 24, single in this particular area in Canada. Facebook apologized, but the, no one really knew how to, who to blame. Not the, was it the algorithm? Is it the company? Is it the programmer? Is it the person who, at the very beginning of this entire process, created that piece of code to fix a very localized solution, which was, how do I find, in this massive bank of images, a woman, 1824, who is single? Now, there are more and more of these ghost stories happening on Facebook, which kind of worry me as someone who looks a lot at this, because you end up the people who are the most um, subject to this are the most vulnerable, the people who perhaps don't want, want things to be kept at their own pace. So, for instance, you have pregnancies that are outed on Facebook because you search Google for pregnancy tests or pregnancy advice, and then your partner that you share the computer with finds out without you having the chance to tell them. Or you have a child that's outed by their parents because they share a computer looking for advice about their sexuality. Now, 
Facebook's On This Day is a really good example of this in some ways, and something that I call means well technology, where a technological solution is put into a sociological and cultural um, friction or messiness, essentially. All of our cultural stuff is there. And in this case, a very well-meaning service tries to make your experience in the grand vacuum of Facebook feel far more personal, but ends up alienating you because it doesn't understand the context of the things that are thrown up. This is an example of where an algorithmic solution for the burden of information, because there's absolutely loads of crap on Facebook, and we all know that, um, causes social and cultural friction. You end up not just being haunted by weird things that you once posted on your friend's page. I mean, with this tweet, uh, Facebook thought that Pierce Brosnan on a horse was a meaningful memory that the person wants to be reminded of. But also you get the, the, kind, of all the, the kind of slightly awful, uncomfortable weirdness, which is ex-lovers and dead friends and friendships that you kind of would rather forget about and suddenly come up because algorithms do not know the context of a photograph. Machine learning can tell you what it is, who it is, who it is in relation to other people, but not what it means to you. You have to contextualize these things. They don't have our faulty methodology in contextualization, and in this way, these algorithms aren't actually very neutral. They're very biased and pre like prejudiced towards people who author them and create them. Now, the stone tape theory is something that I've been looking at as a way of kind of coping and dealing with these potential data ghosts. The stone tape theory is the idea that an object or a house can be a recorder of memories or a recorder of things. And in the horror genre, as in the case with this uh, piece of film from the 1970s, which is in Britain, this recorded house suddenly plays back at a moment of extreme emotional triggers. So you have uh, the grief or the birth of someone or a, a massive breakup suddenly causes um, these ghosts to reappear and to run havoc through the house. Because databases are becoming like stone tapes. When the right emotional trigger hits, the poltergeist begins to take action. You don't notice any of these algorithmic breaks in Facebook until they do actually break. And from then on, you're kind of screwed because you can see them. But you can't do anything about them because you don't know how to. Because the system is so opaque that you wouldn't even know where to start. Which is why it's really hard to find them or design for them. Because there's no programmer here or designer here can ever fully anticipate where their technology is going to end up, and I'm not expecting you guys to obviously completely run through every possible option. But we should have more awareness that they exist beyond software fixes. Now, there's a, a, another great ghost story. I use a lot of ghost stories. I think they're, they're quite, for me, they're quite a, a comfortable, I say a comfortable and uncomfortable way of talking about this stuff. It's the doppelganger. Now, the doppelganger in classical mythology is uh, an exact copy of you, moment you see moments before your death. And Edgar Allan Poe, as Tobias told me when we were rehearsing this earlier, did the most famous story of this, and you should definitely go and check it out. Um, and in this case, if you look at the future, when we start to see ourselves and see the breakages and things maybe we don't want in the systems that we can't control, that kind of signals the potential demise that we do have. And when I gave a talk very similar to this, or the early days of, of my thinking about this in New York, I asked who was the exorcist in this situation? Who do we call on to get rid of the ghost? And I actually realized that there isn't one, and if there is, the, 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 there's kind of no point in being there. Because once you remove a technology which causes these problems, or if you sunset a service, the problem it causes don't suddenly evaporate. You're still left with all the damage, so how do we go about reducing the extent of the damage when you're not paying attention to the, t the fact that your technology is entering into a system, not a vacuum? Your solution is not the only solution, it is entering into a world of other people's solutions. It's going to bump up against what other people think is the right thing, and you have to be aware of the fact that you are not the person who's going to be the answer often. Other people's technologies happen to us. Whenever we enter into a system, we deal with everything else that people throw at us. Now, this is a quote from a friend of mine, Deb Chatra, who reappropriated the quote that Nicola mentioned earlier, which is, any sufficiently advanced neglect is indistinguishable from malice. Now, most companies, I hope, and technologists and designers, many of you obviously in this room, don't deliberately want to be malicious in the technology that you're making. However, if you don't think about the fact that your solution is not the only one and it is going to enter into a whole host of different things, then you are going to end up causing problems and it might as well be malice. Because new mythologies are being written and summoned into reality through the dense and often really unforgiving tide of innovation. I mean, if any of you have seen Microsoft products, uh, Microsoft's product vision videos or any millions of Kickstarter videos that exist and advertising, these are the things that are telling us the future that we should have, that we deserve, that we could have if we let the flood of innovation happen. 
uninterrupted and uncontested and unscrutinized. Now, this is a still from one of Microsoft Product Vision videos. Now, there's a very kind of quote where it says from Kurt Vonnegut, who says, everything was beautiful and nothing hurt, or in this case, nothing breaks. And these fictions and narratives are being willed into being with these really idealized users who are very easy to solve when a problem comes up. They're from your own biases and your own experiences, which are relatively narrow, and they're quite dumb, really. Um, and they're imagined by these people who want to do well, and we all do want to do well. I don't think anyone in this room is hopefully not an evil genius. If you are, where's your white cat? And they become real once th and these narratives become real when we don't really pay attention to where they could potentially go wrong. Now, a lot of my work at Future Everything and Changeist is kind of preparing for these very uncertain futures and looking at future, the future through the lens of art and design and primarily narrative. As my colleague Scott Smith mentioned when I talked to him about this before the talk, futures is the bones. It's the thing that kind of is the skeleton of stuff. And narrative becomes the flesh. The narrative is the thing that walks about with your technology and it walks around in your technology and has to deal with it. Because these imagined near future fictions progress, we really need to have these counter narratives that push this, these ideals that perhaps might actually cause people some problems off course. We need to start breaking them because if we don't break them, who will? It will be the people who are subject to them. And threads need to come undone as near future laboratories Nick Foster talks about. We need to think about the future mundane and the broken futures and the people that perhaps we don't often uh, design for. Because when we imagine the future of a product or a service, we can totally anticipate in, in many ways a software bug or a hardware issue, but not with a technology that you've let out into the world might cause someone distress or exclude them or make their life harder. The greatest example of this that I like using is that Apple's health kit in the first iteration didn't think that women tracking their periods was an important enough metric to include in their first iteration. They, they put it in the second one, great, thanks guys, but already women felt incredibly excluded from a system that they were supposed to make them feel better. That, that's, that's a narrative that we should, that it's not okay. An app update is not enough. As I mentioned in the Exorcist example, the damage has already been done by that point. So to start to create these stories which are a bit wonky and broken and weird can help us to become more resilient in problem solving and far more empathetic and think a lot more about the futures that perhaps other people could be living with our technology. Now I wanted to give a few examples of uh, technology kind of being subject to these biases that we might not necessarily think of. This is a, a TV show, a Scottish TV show called Burnistown. And these two guys are trying to use a voice recognition elevator. Um, and they're saying in very Scottish accents, 11, 11, 11. And this, this lift is just basically saying, I'm sorry, I do not recognize that command. Because it was designed by Americans. And so therefore, and they didn't ever think of someone with a heavily Scottish Glaswegian accent. I'm sorry to all Scottish people that I tried to replicate there. <laughs> Um, th th it doesn't work for them. So you're subject to the, very much subject to these biases, and these biases lock people out of your technology because you didn't think they would use it in that way. And this is a great scene from uh, what Nicola's uh, film, actually, from Near Futures Laboratory, where he works, uh, for Curious Rituals, which I do recommend that you go and watch, where the user of a smart car shouts into a car phonetically rather than the way that this, this, voice, this, this name is set to recognize a name that's not American and not English. So she has to kind of say, Geraldo rather than Geraldo, which is the guy's name. And now back to a more contemporary ghost story. I really hope some of you have had a chance at least to probe into the weird world of Charlie Brooker's Black Mirror. It's kind of like a very modern Twilight Zone in some ways. Um, and in this particular ghost story, there is a, this woman loses her husband, unfortunately, and her very, very well-meaning friend says to her, do you know what, this is a fantastic service that you can use, which will literally bring him back to life, using all of his data, his social media profiles, his voice calls, everything possible, which for a start indicates a future where private companies have access to every single bit of your data to do this, which is terrifying enough. But in this case, this service that tries to do well and tries to give you comfort in a time of incredible grief actually scares the hell out of this woman. I mean, she's sitting on the end of a sofa here, but there's a fantastic scene where she locks him in the bathroom because she's absolutely terrified of this thing that's not her husband, not this person. It's a manifestation of him. He is the doppelganger. And he symbolizes this anxiety that we have around our data, where we start to see things and, and they start to creep out of the cracks and things. Now, using narrative futures design, which is a lot of what I, I look at, is looking beyond trend reports, using them as an, as an informant and horizon scanning, which is a, a lot of futurists use and bringing in ethnographers and anthropologists and artists and critical designers to come into these processes to kind of pull them apart and break them. Because we need to create more stories about potential hauntings where our data could create harm. 
because although it might not at every single instance, knowing that it could allows you to slow down and think twice. In the early days of your technology, way back before prototyping the product, prototype the kind of futures what that it could have, not what you think it's going to have, because even if you think it might go something weird, hand it to someone else, give it to a different diverse group and say, okay, so we kind of broke it in this way, but we know that we don't, we're not everyone, so maybe you guys have a go at it. Um, because you need to think about where someone's quality of life is compromised because you didn't think it would ever be used in that way. There's a really kind of interesting example that I always use about the idea that if you're the, the, in a support group and a child says to you, I want to look up, I think I might be gay. I want to, to look up information about this. And then a few sort of forum posts later, he says, my parents have kicked me out because they found out from their Facebook advertising that I'm gay, they're not happy about it. We can't anticipate for that, but knowing those kind of narratives do take place is really important. Because we want to have a cert we want to have a future where we don't just try and design for the best possible circumstance. Because realistically, if the world's messy enough as it is, it's not going to suddenly clean up over the next kind of like app few app updates. It's ridiculous. So tell more ghost stories, freak yourselves out a bit, be a bit weird. Here's Patrick Swayze. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Natalie. Hi. Uh, one of the questions we, we got was uh, mm -hmm. about the haunted algorithm thing. Can you elaborate on that? What, the haunted what algorithm. It, yeah, haunted algorithms. What, can, you, can there be haunted algorithms? I think it's more the case because algorithms are a very logical system. They, just, they, they know what's true and false, but the problem is they kind of have a puppet master behind them mm. that chooses the data sets that they, they choose to take from. They choose to, to determine who is, what's true and what's false. And then you think, hang on, so this true and false might not be the same as someone else. And they kind of create these weird gaps where mm -hmm. they're used by different people and different conflicting systems. And that's kind of where the ghosts and weird hauntings happen. Uh, can there be good haunted machines or algorithms? Because yeah. it's part of the friction of everyday life mm. uh, to, well, to have frictions, to have things that break, mm. that could be funny, that could be original. Not yeah. all frictions are bad. Yeah, I mean, a lot of frictions will, are, are, are quite amusing. I mean, um, there's definitely a place for magic, as a colleague of ours, Ingrid Burrington, says. There's a place where you can use it to explore weirdness and explore strange things and, and, and mm. be delighted by stuff. But, like, there's a, there's a problem between... I mean, Tobias mentioned this about empowerment and enchantment. Enchantment kind of, like, pulls the wool over your eyes, mm -hmm. but empowerment gives you the ability to do the magic. And there's a, a course that Greg Borenstein runs at um, MIT that talks about designers using magic. And I'd like to explore a little bit more what they mean by that, because I, I like the idea that we still have a capacity and a place for magic in the world, and to be excited and delighted mm -hmm. by stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's just making sure that who casts the magic and who gets to make that magic is thought of. Yeah. Right. Cool. Thank you very Thank much. You.